Yep. Are we live? Okay, I think we are. Or? Okay, it's loading. We are live. Okay, uh, hi all, um, and welcome to our antimicrobial resistance webinar. Uh, my name is Hannah, and I'm a general assistant for Europe with an external focus on antimicrobial resistance. And uh, I will be here today delivering you this topic with the help of uh, Sasha and Peter, and they will introduce themselves uh, when it's their turn. So uh, the reasons why are we doing this webinar is uh, because the antimicrobial resistance has been uh, selected as a European external priority. And we think that uh, it is our job to uh, spread this topic and to work on incapacitating our members, both on the internal and the external level. Uh, so ba basically on the internal level, we are here talking about the activities that you're doing in your NMOs, both on the local and national level. While uh, on the external level, we're, uh, we are talking about the advocacy measures that uh, you will be undertaking. Um, so uh, we will have uh, three actually parts of this webinar. And the first one will be about the health burden of antimicrobial resistance. The second one will be about the internal work done on the IFMSA, mostly related to IFMSA programs. And the third part will be uh, done basically uh, on the uh, European external priority. Uh, so feel free to ask questions on the live chat uh, in, at YouTube, and we have designated some time to answer you in the end. Um, so we will start uh, with the health burden of the antimicrobial resistance in Europe, and we will start with Sasha. So Sasha, please Hi, introduce Anna. yourself. Yes. Hi, Hannah. Um, this is Sasha. I'm a policy, former policy manager, I should say, at the European Public Health Alliance in Brussels, of which IFMSA are members. And thank you very much um, to you, Hannah, and the team for the opportunity to present our campaign on, on AMR. Um, what, what I'll be saying is not only about the health burden, I, I should probably say, it's, it's probably more a description of our overall campaign and to kind of tell you guys what we're doing at European excuse me at European level to keep it high on the on the policy agenda and I've uh, I've got a presentation uh, prepared and I'm hoping it'll work oh. there it is so you should be able to see this on your screens right now if not, then let me know. Um, so just a few words about IFA for those of you who don't know IFA, and I'm assuming many of you don't necessarily know what IFA is. So okay. IFA is a... We press uh, share screen again, because I, I just see you. Oh, you see me. OK. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's see how to do that. Share. Okay. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sharing screen again. It should work now. Now it's working. And back to presentation mode. So, once again, um, assuming some of you don't know what IFA is, let me just say a few words um, to explain what we do and who we are. Um, IFA is um, probably the largest public health membership organization based in Brussels, and we have about currently have about 95 something members representing disease specific organizations, health professionals, vulnerable groups, some regional interests. And many others, and obviously students are also um, a very important part of this. 
our mission, um, globally speaking, is to bring together the public health community to provide leadership and facilitate change and crucially to improve health and reduce inequalities. And it is basically from this angle that we're looking also at the AMR issue because we realize it's not only about reduction of um, antibiotics use, but it's also um, maintaining access and, and guaranteeing access for vulnerable groups, um, not only in Europe, but globally. So our vision would be for everybody to have sustainable, um, sorry, access to a sustainable and high quality health system in Europe. And also for Europe to really assume its um, global responsibilities beyond our borders. Now, talking about the global health and the economic burden that um, Hannah already alluded to, um, for us, the work on, on AMR, although we could have started probably 20 years ago, it really started for us with um, the recognition by former health commissioner uh, John Daly uh, that AMR had become Europe's biggest public health threat in 2012, and this coincided the first action plan that was released around that time uh, the 2011 to 2016 action plan. Obviously, a lot of things um, have been set into motion by this action plan, and I'll be going into this in more detail in a moment. Um, but you may be aware that last year, um, a big review was undertaken in the, in the UK, um, the so-called UK review on AMR by Jim O'Neill and his team. And this really uh, put, made a strong economic case to act on AMR because they found that um, by 2050, the death, call, death toll could be a staggering one, one in every three seconds if AMR is not tackled now. And they, they put a, an economic price tag on this, saying that in terms of lost global production between now and 2050, an enormous 100 trillion US dollars could be lost if, if we remain inactive. And this has also, of course, been looked at by the OECD in terms of um, the human health burden. And they say that patients infected with resistant infections require more intensive and expensive care, and they're more likely to be admitted to hospital uh, as a result of this. And hospitals spend on average, hospitals spend on average an, ad an additional 10 to 40,000 US dollars to treat patients infected by resistant bacteria in the region. So it's really a strong case to act now and do it right. And this is then something going back to Europe that the Dutch presidency last year um, also very much recognized in their council conclusions. They asked the European Commission to develop a follow-up action plan um, taking a, a so-called One Health perspective. And I'll tell you what that means in a moment. Now, I'm not going to be talking much about this particular um, slide, which can be fr quite frustrating, but this is just to show you um, the different layers of the problem. There's the international layer, so WHO Global Action Plan on AMR. There's the European layer, um, meaning the existing action plan and its um, successor that's under development right now. Um, there are obviously the council conclusions I've just alluded to. There's the work of European agencies, including the European Medicines Agency, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control in Stockholm, and of course also the European Food Safety Authority in Italy. And then you have the more national or regional layer, um, meaning that European countries and other countries around the world are putting together their national action plans to um, meet the WHO requirements. Now, what is IFA doing on this? Um, in 2015, I think it was, yes, we've just had our new Secretary General in place. Um, we asked our members to um, decide on a number of um, campaigns to streamline our work and um, it was endorsed by our members in 2015 because it, it seemed to be an issue that everybody um, was concerned with, that everybody could contribute to. Because indeed, um, AMR is a very complex societal issue as this slide you're looking at right now um, is, is, is showing. It's not only about prudent use of antibiotics in, in human healthcare or in veterinary medicine and agriculture. It's also about the balance between access and uh, excess use of, of antibiotics. It's about surveillance and monitoring, um, having the right data available, basically, because we know we don't have that data available right now. 
It's about infection control and prevention. It's about hygiene and hospitals and other healthcare settings. It's about patient safety, of course. Crucially, it's about education and training. I'll be obviously talking about this in a moment. It's about alternatives to antibiotics, um, not only vaccination and rapid diagnostics, but also perhaps ensuring that people remain healthy in the first place, looking at other alternatives that might be out there and research. It's about animal welfare and production systems um, of food. It's about the environment in the end, because what happens to the environment also has consequences for human health. Everything is connected. People travel, bacteria travel, health professionals travel. So everything is related. And this is the one health idea that human health, the environment, and animal health are closely connected through trade and mobility. And then, of course, it's about the um, innovation model that we'd like to see for antibiotics. What, what role does industry play in this and what can they do to, to change things, to move from a very profit-oriented system to one that perhaps emphasizes um, solidarity in Europe? And ultimately, when it comes to um, policy, it's about um, governing, governance for AMR. Um, there's much talk about creating or has already been created a new network, a One Health network on AMR. However, um, the governance of this network remains unclear. So as part of our, um, as part of EFA's AMR campaign, um, just like IFMSA, we've been um, supporting the European Antibiotic Awareness Day and we've been making statements there over the last few years. And also um, I, I did a video um, in, in order to keep AMR high on the European agenda. That was our main concern for EAAD. We've created an internal working group on, on AMR, and I'm pleased to say IFMSA, again, are very active in this, and, and we also have a scientific advisor for this working group. We've been meeting European and national policymakers as much as possible, and our partners, also located in Brussels and elsewhere, to, to talk about AMR, exchange our views, and see what kind of recommendations can we develop together. We've um, created some um, communication support for this, um, a new um, news feed, a monthly news feed, obviously use of our website um, and social media, including Twitter. And we've, uh, we've been working on a number of publications, beginning really with our recommendations for the Dutch Presidency Council conclusions last year, but also um, reports then on prudent use in human medicine, because this coincided with um, ECDC's work on the guidelines. We've, been, um, we've produced a briefing on the evaluation of the um, old action plan. We've commissioned a legal briefing on EU competences in AMR-related areas, because although it's always being said, and, and, and it's true, that European competences in public health as such, and in human health particularly, are limited, this doesn't mean that um, the, the EU couldn't be using its competences in all related fields, from food security to environmental policy, agricultural policy, etc., to, to sort of ensure that the safety net, the European safety net, remains tight. And, uh, and now, really, we're working on our position on the follow-up action plan, which is still under development. We've just had a working group um, meeting last week, and we're hoping to come up with some strong um, proposals for this. Um, the AMR campaign is linked in with other EFA work, um, notably um, our campaign on universal access to affordable medicines. I already mentioned the innovation model debate. And of course, it's also related to sustainable food and agriculture and to trade, particularly in the transatlantic context. The goals of our campaign would be to reframe AMR as a public health issue, and not only a public health issue, also a health security issue, to make sure that, that really people understand that um, whatever happens in one country can easily spill over the borders. This is a cross-border healthcare threat of utmost that requires utmost attention and action. And, and um, while we're pleased that the One Health approach is guiding the work, we think this really should be on the EU agenda throughout the year. Best practices will have to be um, disseminated much better across the region. And, and crucially, policy coherence is, uh, is uh, something that needs to be practiced and not only talked about, especially when you have this multi-layer architecture from the international to the local level, basically. 
Uh, and of course, indeed, we'd like to see a very strong role for Europe as a leading global region, because if we don't do things right here, chances are they won't happen elsewhere where resources are restricted. And perhaps many of the things that are successfully already happening in countries like Sweden, the Netherlands, Denmark, etc., would be that much harder to implement in those countries. So that things need to be adapted in a certain way, and we need to we need to really talk about this now. As part of our campaign, we've had a couple of events. I'm just going to mention these very briefly. One was on the environmental dimension of um, AMR, which tended to be a little bit forgotten as part of the first action plan. However, um, the the um, the roadmap for the um, follow-up action plan has already indicated that this will be um, uh, this will feature much strong, much more strongly in the in the follow-up action plan. And we've also had a side event together with the Wellcome Trust uh, on communicating AMR. And this was quite interesting because obviously there are widespread uh, misconceptions about the issue um, and people um, thinking that antibiotics um, will help them cure the flu, for example. This is still very, uh, very widespread. And, and very often these misconceptions are socioculturally determined uh, which then also determines their sort of overall uh, attitudes and behaviors. Not only patients, but also health professionals. So um, another uh, sort of stream of work um, still staying within the environmental dimension is global supply chains. And there I just want to emphasize um, that um, the production process of, um, of um, of pharmaceuticals, particularly in third countries like China and India, um, is, of, is also polluting the environment in these countries. And then resistant bacteria, like I said earlier, they can travel quite easily when people and animals come into contact with these. So it really starts at the source. And then thinking about animal health and agriculture, we've been working, for example, with the Alliance to Save Our Antibiotics based in London. And um, this slide here says quite neatly that this is not only about agriculture, this is about the effect that losing antibiotics would have on human medicine. And from a public health perspective, obviously for us, this is very crucial because things like major surgery, organ transplantation, treatment of preterm babies, cancer chemotherapy, and, and all these things that we take um, pretty much for granted today would not be possible without having access to effective treatment for bacterial infections. Now, finally, the final part of my presentation is about influencing um, stakeholders. Um, so what can we do as advocacy um, actors? Who are the key stakeholders and, and how can they be reached, basically? Now, yes, from our perspective, very much, students are super important because you are the next generation. You are um, the future health professionals. And obviously, um, it would be fantastic if not only medical students' education, but health professional students' education would include AMR. And even starting before your studies, but I'm talking here um, really from primary school through to your studies and beyond, um, you may have heard of um, things like the um, eBug platform that's teaching um, really young students from an early age um, in, in an online environment to, to learn about AMR. And, and become more responsible and, and, and perhaps it'll also shape uh, patients' um, understanding of antibiotics and, and, and will sort of push them to, to um, demand fewer antibiotics in the future. But, but of course also education is important to build AMR champions and change uh, professional behaviors. So I think by involving students as much as possible from an early age, uh, uh, from an early stage, um, not only become students empowered, but they can also empower others and, and they will feel part of the, the conversation. And, and I'm sure we have a lot to learn from you guys because you're the ones uh, using new technology at the cutting edge of technology um, to begin with. So um, all the power to you. But of course, health professionals as such, and again, not only doctors, but nurses, pharmacists, and everybody else really who plays a role in prevention, for example, um, are important actors. And um, many of whom are trying to um, extend their roles. And I think as part of this, we need to talk about um, 
prescribing behaviors and, and perhaps think about incentives for people who are prescribing to prescribe more prudently or intelligently. Um, we need to think about enforcement of existing legislation there as well, because I mean, in theory, um, obtaining um, antibiotics um, illegally is, 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 is banned in, in, in Southern Europe as much as in Northern Europe and Eastern Europe as much as in the West. So we need to promote antimicrobial stewardship, I think, more and also multidisciplinary work. We need to raise awareness and uh, CPD, I think, also plays a large role because things get forgotten quite easily. This is really throughout careers. And this is not only about health professionals, this is also about vets and about farmers and animal keepers where, as we know, antibiotics are used even more than in human medicine um, at times. And we need to stimulate dialogue between these actors and promote best practices. And I already mentioned that patients are also part of this. We're all responsible and patients need to become aware that they can't just demand antibiotics all the time. They shouldn't just stack them away in their um, medicine cap um, cabinets at home and, and, and things like that. And I'm almost done. Um, industry and the research community, um, industry needs to take responsibility as well. I mean, this is not only about um, asking for better incentives, um, because a lot of money has already been spent, public money has been spent mm -hmm. on AMR research. Um, this is also about ensuring that um, other actors can engage in research and that new innovation models, if they are available, really do get implemented. implemented sorry. Uh, and perhaps there should even be something like making public funding contingent on clean production methods, thinking about global supply chains, for example. In terms of national and regional policymakers, um, we'd like them to expand their awareness campaigns. We'd like them to set ambitious goals and targets that can not only meet national goals, but also with a view to Europe, perhaps contribute to European headline targets in the future and really ensure this um, One Health dialogue and approach to things. And then as a final word about um, Europe, like I mentioned before, we, we, we really think that Europe is crucial in this. Uh, it is crucial because we know about the um, differences between countries in terms of having resources at their disposal to implement their national action plans in terms of funding, in terms of human resources. So um, Europe must make sure that dedicated AMR resources are available. And I think there are a number of sources from structural funds to um, regional funds that can be uh, utilized for this and they need to be known. And um, as I said earlier as well, we need to make sure that we not only um, talk about this, but that, that we may also make use of legislative powers. There can be hard powers, so actual legislation where possible, but where this isn't possible, then we need to think about utilizing soft powers more effectively and nudging countries uh, in the right direction. And then, of course, uh, in the global arena, as a final word, um, we'd like to see Europe to play a leading role and really steer those discussions that will happen this year, for example, at G20 level here in Germany, where I'm right now, um, but also um, drive forward the UN discussions and the WHO work on this. And with that, um, I've come to the end of my presentation. And I think I've just about managed that in 15 minutes. And I'll be um, switching back in the hope that you can see me again. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Sasha. Uh, uh, thank you for all of this information. I think that uh, our, the people who are uh, watching us had uh, a lot of um, important information given to them and uh, I just want to tell you not to feel lost we're gonna go through some of the internal and external parts of our work that we are doing in the IFMSA now and uh, I think that as you're probably aware at this point uh, antimicrobial resistance is a really complex topic and it can be approached from different views um, now, uh, Petar, uh, who is our program coordinator on communicable diseases, is going to present to you about his efforts on this area, some of the campaigns that he's been involved in, and what are his plans for the future. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I hope that you can see my screen. 
Okay, great. So hello everyone, I'm Peter. I'm currently a and say program coordinator in communicable diseases, and today I'm here to speak to you about what Dive and say has been doing and is going to continue doing in the next several months at least. So um, the actions of Ivan say in regards to antimicrobial resistance started um, during the past year between the 15th and 21st of November with Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Um, so we had three key actions that I think was focusing on. The first one being educating medical students specifically, then collecting data towards building a global policy paper of IFMSA, and finally encouraging medical students to take action locally and nationally. Part was um, also one of the major um, goals of the IFMSA program in communic communicable diseases under which this, these actions are happening. And it is important to say that these general activities happen in cooperation with IVSA and IPSF, re respectively the Veterinary and the Pharmaceutical Student Association. So in regards to educating medical students, uh, we had 258 students completing our pre-assessment and an additional 414 students completing a post-assessment. However, uh, after compar comparing a remote we concluded that about 230 students, or about 76% of, of our actual target group, have increased their knowledge on our primary goals. Uh, of course, we're going to continue our actions on the international level, while we still continue focusing on the local and national one. In regards to research, we had input collected from 414 students. Um, 365 of them are medical, and 49 are other healthcare students. However, we're definitely not reaching our target group so far. Therefore, we're going to do this survey and we're going to continue collecting data in the next several months. And the goal of the survey is to be able to build an evidence-based policy paper for uh, IFMC and possibly other healthcare student organizations in order to be able to advocate internationally with that. And finally, regarding a medical student taking action on the local and national level, uh, during the period up, to, up until this point, we have had 11 activities related to the awareness week enrolled under the program, 10 of them national and one regional within the Americas region. This encompasses about 75% of our target, and we already have seven additional activities which are currently being screened uh, for eligibility to be enrolled under the program. Um, and However, it is also important to say that reporting of all of those activities is still yet to take place as we haven't been able to uh, properly evaluate their impact yet. Uh, therefore, once we have this, we're going to be able to see exactly what the, uh, the impact of IFMSA and all of those animals currently is. Here you can see the world map of the activities that took place during the Awareness Week last year. Focus is within the Americas, Europe, and mostly Asia and the Pacific. However, we do hope that we're going to have more activities happening, especially in the North American region, as well as the African region and EMR. And finally, what can you do? Uh, so you can become educated as a medical student or other healthcare student. I've may say has already provided you with all the necessary resources. You can find the toolkit reg regarding education, then the toolkit for campaigning to the general population, as well as to other medical students, and finally, to um, medical professionals as well, uh, which is an important course. Uh, then we also have the advocacy manual prepared for you in regards to national and local policies on AMR. I find quite important. We're also happy to say that two of the I just mentioned, the creation of a national policy within this. Um, so after you become educated, it is important that you investigate what is the situation on antimicrobial resistance within your own country and where is it necessary to take action on that. So is it that the general people are sufficiently educated or is it perhaps that your country doesn't have a, a policy about how to use antimicro antimicrobials including antibiotics. So depending on the needs of your own country, you should action. So when you're taking this action, you obviously need to plan it and you and this is how you can contribute to the global impact, and that can happen today. And of course, I do want to emphasize on the importance of evaluating your impact. Organizing activities not always lead to actual impact and doesn't always lead to positive impact either. So it is quite important that you're able to 
uh, properly evaluate whether or not you're contributing to the global objectives that we have in terms of AMR. If you have any questions or if you uh, don't have direct access to the on AMR, feel free to approach us at any given point and to you. Right. If you have any questions, you can ask them at the end. Mm. Anna, back to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for giving us uh, an overview of all the activities done in the IFMSA on this topic. And we know that uh, actually this is what programs are for, to collect the data and uh, in order to understand what has been done in our NMOs on the internal level. Things that I will be talking about is actually the uh, antimicrobial resistance as a European external priority. Um, I'm just waiting for my slides to load because the connection is kind of slow. But nevertheless, uh, what I want to show you is that one of the ways to actually bring your activities on a bigger level is to include them into your advocacy work. Um, as we all know, we as medical students have uh, opinions on different topics, but one of the ways to uh, actually support those opinions and to support our advocacy work is by uh, having the foundation from the activities done on our local and national level. One of the ways that you can promote not only your activities, but also your NMO to the stakeholders. Um, let me just share it. Okay. Uh, so, um, what I wanted to, to, to say as the first thing is that um, um, in the European region, we, we've been quite busy with, um, with uh, working on the antimicrobial resistance as it is one of the European external priorities. And we have actually started working even before our term has started, uh, since we have written a policy brief on AMR uh, mm -hmm. at the WHO regional uh, committee for Europe in Copenhagen and uh, continuing with all the efforts that, that have been done currently on the topic. One of the most important things that I would like to emphasize is the partnerships that we've been involved in, uh, with, uh, especially with the European Public Health Alliance, uh, with attending their uh, AMR working group meetings and giving input to the documents that are relevant for the whole Europe. Um, for more on why the input to, to different meetings and input to different documents is important, is uh, you can see our guideline on giving input that has been produced by the Euroteam. Um, we have also established a really good communication with the European Commission as we have invited them to participate in our uh, antimicrobial resistance panel discussion that had, that had happened at the YoFest. And uh, in case you didn't know, the YoFest was an event that was organized by the European Youth Forum and the IFMSA was a partner there working on the health-related topics, uh, delivering sessions and workshops and working on panel. Um, on different healthcare topics uh, from abortion to refugees and antimicrobial resistance. We actually believe that this panel was an important thing because it set uh, a foundation for further collaboration and we are really happy about it. So you can see the picture from the panel here. Um, also, um, when we're talking about European Commission, uh, as uh, Sasha has mentioned, there has recently been a call on the One Health Action Plan to support member states in fight against antimicrobial resistance by the, by the European Commission. So um, what is actually One Health Action Plan? Uh, well, One Health is an approach about a holistic view to address challenges in human and animal health, in food security and poverty. And we believe that um, antimicrobial resistance uh, as a topic has uh, influenced all of that. And uh, when, uh, we, um, when we realized that there was a call for the civil society also to include their opinions and, and their stance on this topic, uh, we are planning to uh, also spread this call further to our NMOs and um, uh, to give input together as the IFMSA based by your ideas and expectations. 
fortunately we do have enough time in order to do so so uh you can expect a call soon after the march meeting well since the amr is such a complex topic and actually all the healthcare students are involved in the problem we have also established communication with them that goes uh, a bit beyond uh, only the one health joint statement uh, there have also been our, our panelists in the uh, AMR panel discussion on, uh, at the Yofest. We have had um, IFSA, the International Veterinary Students Association, and EPSA, European Pharmaceutical Students Association. And uh, we are proud to say that our collaboration um, had not stopped there, as we have been invited to both write an article for EPSA's newsletter, and we are currently working on some other topics with them. So this kind of Sustainability is something that we are aiming for when working with all of our stakeholders. Um, we um, are very happy actually that they could join the YoFest and, and talk from their perspective and not only as uh, on the threats that uh, AMR poses to them in their future work, but also on the advocacy they are engaging in on the topic. And um, as it was a really interesting discussion between the student organization uh, and the European Commission. You can also uh, watch it at the IFMSA YouTube account. Um, when we talk about external representation, there's something that uh, uh, both Alice and me as general assistants uh, were um, trying to do from the beginning, and that is the collection from the, of the input from the NMOs. Uh, we wanted to hear from you on how do you imagine our work and, and where do you think would be our help most needed. And this is why uh, we wanted to do more of an internal support of the work uh, of your policy work and uh, to give you tools in order to in order to deliver your vision to the stakeholders and actively engage your NMO in advocacy. So we have produced um, two documents and one is uh, based on giving input on the IFMSA level and one is based on policy making which is mostly focused on the national level. In these documents, uh, there are tips and tricks on how to start with your external work and how to be able to deliver the right message by taking the input from your members. The, the thing about policy documents is that you should look at them as tools that can help you in that. So I would advise you to take a look at, them, at the toolkits and manuals that we've produced and take what is needed for your local and national level. And we will be really happy to receive your input also on them. And we're certainly going to follow up on how actually they are useful for, for the NMOs and for the IFMSA. Uh, for example, uh, IFMSA uses policy documents for supporting advocacy in producing statements uh, and for the external meetings and to understand the background of certain actions that we are undertaking. We also need regional policy documents for regional priorities and, and for the work focused on them. And this is why uh, we have produced a regional policy document uh, which will be voted on at the March meeting. And the best thing about it is that uh, now, uh, when you're filled with knowledge on antimicrobial resistance after watching this webinar, you can also contribute and give your input. Um, you can check uh, uh, with your NMO presidents to share you the document, or you can look at our uh, AMR European newsletter when you can find the link towards it. Um, Antimicrobial resistance European newsletter is also something that uh, we are really proud of because uh, we believe that in this short and concise way we can deliver you most of the um, relevant issues that have been talked about in the in the Europe on this topic and also we can deliver you our plans and objectives for the future as well as you can see our achievement from the past on this topic. Uh, lately, there have been a lot of um, work around the antimicrobial resistance in the IFMSA. And uh, one of the most important things that has been done is public health leadership training that has happened in the EMR regional meeting, and it will also be conducted in March meeting in Budva. Um, here, the background uh, of the idea is to empower the members to understand the, the problem completely uh, from why it happens to all the ways to how to tackle the antimicrobial resistance. And um, I myself, I'm really excited to have given the opportunity to facilitate and spread the knowledge to our future members in Budva. 
as uh, for the future that what we are planning is um, first of all to work more closely on uh, gathering input from NMOs uh, focused on the European Commission One Health Action Plan uh, to continue promoting our external work to continue and improve our collaborations both with EPA, European Commission, and with our student organizations, and continue working on the AMR European newsletter. Uh, it is a, a bit of a challenge to work on such a broad external topic, but I believe that with the joint effort of the Euro team and the NMOs, we can certainly make a difference. Or if you have any questions or ideas, it would be great if you could approach me, because I am always happy to receive input. Um, I hope that this has given you uh, an overview of what has been done in the European region and uh, in, on the external work in that. And uh, I will be really happy to, to if you have any. Hey, Hannah. <laughs> so while um, speaking, I just noticed that apparently my slides were not moving. Yes. So I is. imagine that a lot of people didn't actually understand what I was talking about because they couldn't see what I was referring to. Can you just go uh, through them really quickly again? Yes, of course you can. One the first ones we see. Uh, I noticed. <laughs> okay. This is a big mistake. Sorry for that, guys an issue but once you're able to see the full screen could you please confirm yes sure Now we can see it. It's probably better if you go to present mode, though. That's oh, OK. I mean, I can see it, but it, it comes up with the slide view on the on the side. But I mean, it's fine. But I, I, I think. Press F. Oh, yeah, five. that was better. Yes. Trying to figure out maybe this one. No, can you see it? We can see it. Okay, is it full screen? No, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I, I know what that. It is full. It's still not full screen, at least not on my screen. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> well, then, guys, all I can do is share the presentation with you separately, since you already have the recording of everything that I had to say on those slides. Yeah, I think it was still so possible to follow you, Peter. I think it was fine. Right. So with that, uh, that's everything from my side. Hannah, you have the Okay, thank you. Um, so I would like to first thank all of you who have decided to watch our webinar on Friday evening. Um, we hope there will be a lot more people uh, watching it in the future. And uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you we have given you an overview of the antimicrobial resistance as a serious health threat in Europe and globally. And uh, we hope that uh, we have also given you the initiative to actually approach us, to approach better about the uh, internal work and how to start your activities on AMR and me, the external work, and uh, if you need any kind of advice on the advocacy level. Uh, since there are no questions at this point, um, I would like to thank Petar and Sasha again. Uh, for joining me in this webinar, and I hope to see you soon.
Thank you, Hannah. As, as usual, I think your work is super impressive. And uh, I think we, we have to be really proud of you, to be honest. I think the, the work that Peter was describing, the toolkits and the leadership training and all of that stuff is exactly you know, what I've been trying to convey with my presentation is exactly the kind of stuff that's needed. And if people pick it up and they start acting, I think we'll be in a better place, at least in Europe soon. Here's hoping. Thank you. Yes. Peter, do you want to say something for the end? My connection is terrible, I guess. So thank you, everyone, again. And Sasha, really appreciate it. Forward to medical students more and more active on the emerging issue globally. From my side as well. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.